Dr. Johnson Arbor is going to talk about compassion and and, and anemia. Uh, this is a, a, a very exciting topic. Uh, I'm good friends with Dr. Johnson Arbor, and we've collaborated on a lot of uh, things with our bloodless patients. So I'm very happy to uh, introduce Dr. Kelly Johnson Arbor. Okay, now can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Great, okay, let me. So um, I'm just gonna bring my slides back up. Perfect, so, and you can see my screen. So we're gonna talk back more about ethical aspects of compassion and bloodless medicine today. And um, in this talk, I'm gonna go into it a little bit more of a historical perspective. So again, thank you to the organizers and Dr. Orsoro and the moderators. This is such a great meeting. Um, this took me in a little bit of a different direction than I thought that I'm um, used to going in. So I am definitely not an ethics expert, but I um, wanted to present a little bit about ethics and the historical aspects of it today. Additionally, I do want to say that the principles discussed in this talk are reflected of, of reflective of the experience in the US, but certainly may have relevance to other countries as well. So we are going to do a few things today. We'll talk about the definition of compassion and healthcare. I know that we've gone over this um, multiple times in this meeting, so I'll just give a different perspective. We'll name some concepts that are in the Hippocratic method model of ethics. Um, we'll talk about some principles of informed consent. And finally, we'll discuss some potential limitations of informed consent in bloodless medicine patients. So I'm going to start with a quick case. So this is a case that Dick and I actually had um, maybe about a year ago. So we had a 70 year old man who was a Jehovah's Witness who um, underwent a deceased donor kidney transplant. And then a couple of years later, he developed some pretty severe and progressive anemia. So he initially did not come to our hospital. He was referred to a hematologist at a very well-known academic tertiary care medical center. And the um, hematologist recommended that he undergo outpatient iron infusions. So he did that, but despite those treatments, his hemoglobin kept going down. His hematologist basically um, referred him for palliative care and said that there is no other treatment options available. So the patient took it upon himself to um, move across several states and he showed up in our hospital once his hemoglobin dropped down to 2.8. Um, he was admitted to our facility. <clears throat> Upon admission, he was lethargic. He was slow to answer questions, which is to be expected with a hemoglobin concentration that low. And his hemoglobin actually dropped to 2.2 a couple of days after admission. He looked really, really bad. Um, Dick saw him, did, ordered some labs, and he um, his labs were consistent with iron deficiency. And so Dick recommended treatment with high-dose EPO as well as additional doses of sodium ferric gluconate. Um, I'm the hyperbaric medicine physician here at the hospital, so I was involved because the patient was also referred for hyperbaric medicine evaluation. Um, we were really not able to put him in the hyperbaric chamber initially because he was so altered and so confused, and he, he really did not have the ability to consent for hyperbarics, and he didn't have any family members around with him because, again, he was from out of state. So he ended up just getting um, EPO and IV iron, and 11 days after admission, his hemoglobin went up to three. Um, by that time, his mental status was actually a lot better, and we were able to get him into the hyperbaric chamber, which was great. Once his hemoglobin hit 5.6, he said that he felt better than ever. He was walking the halls, and he said that he was ready to go home. But luckily, we convinced him to stay until his hemoglobin improved a little further. Um, so after three and a half weeks of hospitalization here, his hemoglobin reached 6.9, and he was able to go home, and he did great. So this is just an example of a case that could have gone really badly, but it didn't for a couple of reasons. And I wanted to talk about some of the thought processes in this case um, from the initial interventions to the towards the end of the treatment um, and how we as humans go through these thought processes and come to our conclusions. 
So I'm going to start off by talking about facts and values and norms. So facts are indisputable terms. So the sky is blue, right? That is a fact. You cannot, unless you, I don't know, unless you have some other <laughs> visual disturbance, um, you're not going to be able to prove that the sky is not blue. Values, however, are beliefs that, mo that motivate our decision choices and clinical practices. So this is really important because values are subjective. So I might value politeness, um, and th that value of politeness is going to help me decide how to behave. And those behaviors or standards are the accepted norms that we typically follow. So the value of politeness, politeness might translate into a norm of, you know, saying hi to people in the hallway and saying please and thank you. But again, it's important to remember that the values are very subjective. And so what is a, you know, something that I value might be different than a value that you may express. All right, so in this case, it's definitely a fact that the patient had severe anemia. His hemoglobin was 2.2. So we have an objective measurement of anemia that was severe. That is a fact. We cannot dispute that. But where do we go from there? So in, in anemic patients, the value that we hold as physicians and medical professionals to do no harm often translate into, in, into the widely accepted, accepted norm of giving blood products. So it's a value to do no harm. What does that mean, though? So doing no harm can mean different things from one person to another. And this is where some of the problems come up and some of the misconceptions and misunderstandings about the treatment of bloodless medicine patients all, all may derive from this value of doing no harm. And the way that we perceive healing as physicians can differ from the way that patients perceive healing. Now, we all agree that healing is important, but the ways that we go about the healing process do not always remain convergent. They may certainly diverge. So this is where compassion comes in. So we've heard a lot of different definitions of compassion in the last couple of days. I'm going to enter with another definition of compassion, and this is more of a healthcare-based definition of compassion. So Dr. Edmund Pellegrino um, was a very famous ethicist who actually ran the Ethics Center here at Georgetown University for many years. And he wrote maybe like 600 or so articles about ethics. And in one of those articles, he defines compassion. So Dr. Pellegrino's definition of compassion includes the statement, the patient must enter the predicament of the patient, or the physician must enter the predicament of the patient to feel something of the patient's plight if his or her scientific judgments are to be a morally defensible and suited to the life of a particular patient. So again, this means that as healthcare professionals, we need to really enter our patient's predicament and understand what the patient is going through. Sounds pretty easy, but I don't think that we do a great job of doing this in clinical practice. So here's a couple of cases, and I'm sure that you guys are all familiar with these, but there was a 1991 survey of critical care physicians in Europe, and in that survey, 63% of the physicians said that they would order blood for a Jehovah's Witness patient who was exsanguinating, even if that patient had previously expressed a desire to avoid transfusion. So this is an older article. It's from the 1990s. Maybe it's not as relevant to how we practice today. Or maybe it is, because just over 10 years ago, in 2010, a physician in Italy ordered a transfusion for a patient who had previously declined to receive blood products. Um, and that physician was subsequently charged with assault and convicted at trial. So even knowing the definition of compassion, and I think most of us think that we are compassionate people, somehow we are not conveying that in our clinical practice because we are not getting into the patient's values and the patient's mindset, and we are still doing things like administering blood products to patients who decline them. Why do we do that? So in the US at least, and I, I think this is also true worldwide, um, the Jehovah's Witness patients carry these advanced directives. Now what's interesting and what I recently learned is that these are state specific in the US. So the, the language that is included on the directives is specific for the particular state code. 
Um, here I have codes for both Virginia and the District of Columbia. And you can see that the cards are a little bit different. So the very top of the card, the title is different. In Virginia, it's an advanced directive. In the District of Columbia, it's a durable power of attorney. The um, small print below the title lists the specific code of law in the particular jurisdiction that um, provides relevance for the document. And the language is a little bit different too. So these, you know, and again, we all know this, these are legal documents. These are not documents that are just drawn up hap haphazardly by the Jehovah's Witness population, but they're legal documents. So why, why do we not follow them? Why do we still attempt to, you know, transfuse patients? And why do we still transfuse patients who decline to receive blood products? So to answer this, I looked into why we might not be compassionate. And this is a really difficult topic to discuss. And interestingly, there's not a lot about it in medical literature written by physicians. It's mostly in the nursing literature. So why do we lose compassion in healthcare? And this has been discussed previously during this talk. So I'll go through it pretty quickly. Um, number one, if we don't have support from our colleagues, so if you don't have a collegial team that you work with, you, you might not feel as attached to your job and to your position. If you don't have support from your hospital administration, um, you're going to you, you know, likely feel burnt out and lose compassion. If you don't really understand what you're doing at work, if your work sort of lacks a purpose because you don't have adequate information about your particular duties, you can lose compassion. And then, and I think this is one of the most important ones, if you have a stressful work environment that has been shown to um, decrease compassion. So stress is important. When I talk to the HLC, the local HLC representatives in my area, they tell me that they like to meet with doctors and nurses and healthcare professionals in calm situations because when people are under stress, they tend to not want to engage and learn about bloodless medicine. It's much more difficult to convey these bloodless medicine discussions to physicians and nurses and other professionals when they are under stress, when the patient has a critically low hemoglobin and is in the ICU. So what happens when we're stressed? When we are stressed in the hospital, we don't really have the time to take to read the literature, to discuss it with our colleagues. When we have a lot of fear. We fear that we're going to lose the patient. We're, we fear that we're going to fail either ourselves or the hospital or the patient. And once again, we fear that we're going to cause harm. So again, this concept of doing no harm is so pervasive in our medical culture. When we are stressed, the fear of causing harm is going to make us lose compassion. And that's really important. So um, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the historical aspects of this, where like this concept of doing no harm is so important to us. And it's mentioned over and over again, ever, you know, since the beginning of our first year of medical school. So where does this come from? So back in the 400 BC area, Hippocrates was in Greece. He was a Greek um, ethicist and he authored a bunch of manuscripts on a variety of medical topics. And he was the first to really identify the principles of ethics in medicine and to identify the importance of protecting the interest of the patient. So he wrote the Hippocratic Oath, that was one of his documents, and that is where the first mention comes in of doing no harm. So where does this come from? So back in ancient Greece, anybody could be a doctor. You did not have to go to medical school. You did not have to have specific training. Anybody could do it. And so the Hippocratic Oath was likely crafted in order to draft some sort of a moral code for those who called themselves physicians. Because again, you could be a charlatan, you could be a quack doctor, and you could be selling snake oil, and you could still call yourself a physician. So Hippocrates came out and laid down these basic principles of ethics so that the trained doctors as well as the charlatans could practice medicine in an ethical perspective. So the oath that Hipp Hippocrates wrote was meant to, be, to exist as like a swearing in document for new physicians. And it's still administered today, although it certainly has been modified by some institutions. Um, it's administered as an introductory oath for students who are starting to engage in the practice of medicine. 
So the Hippocratic Oath uh, defines morals for medical behavior. It talks about these pr principles that we've heard about so much during this meeting, uh, beneficence, non-maleficence, and confidentiality. I will go through these very quickly in the interest of time, as they've already been discussed, but beneficence is the concept of doing good to others that is tied in very closely with the concept of, of non-maleficence, which is where we find that concept of doing no harm that we keep coming back to over and over again. And then there's confidentiality, which is the uh, act of protecting our personal information of our patients. And again, before I go to the next slide, again, these are very basic com concepts. And again, they were they were initially defined in the con the context of how anybody could practice medicine. So, um, you know, it was really just a very basic thing, like do not sell snake oil, make sure that your treatments, even if they are not backed by any science, that make sure that they do no harm. And again, we interpret that again today. So unfortunately, the, the concepts of beneficence and non-maleficence are not always indicative of an equal patient-physician relationship as Hippocrates envisioned. So there's been a lot of critics of the Hippocratic Oath. Some of them note that the oath actually promotes paternalism by considering physicians as being superior to their patients. So if you've ever been a patient, you know that this is true. Um, you know, we come to it from the, the, the side of being the physicians and the nurses and the healers. And we are, we, we like to think that the patient is on the same level of us, but they really aren't. If you've been a patient, you know that you are, you're in a cold hospital bed, you're wearing a thin gown, you're not wearing your own clothes, you're not in your own home, you don't have your own books with you, and you're really dependent on the physicians and the nurses to take, to take, to take care of you. Um, even if you are a very intelligent person, you may not have the resources available. You may not have your cell phone charger. You may not have your books. You may not have your computer. You may not be able to look up all the literature that you need to have the adequate and full knowledge to discuss your condition with your patients. Um, and in some Hippocratic documents, the patients were actually expected to place themselves fully in the physician's hands and obey their command. So this really shows how there is some paternalism that goes back to the Hippocratic Oath. So what's paternalism? It's an action taken by one person in the best interests of another, allegedly, but without the patient's consent. And there's two different types. There's strong paternalism, and that's when we take an action against the wishes of somebody who's competent. We don't see a lot of that in medicine, thankfully, but what we do see is that to this day, we still use weak paternalism, which was in, which was when we take actions under the presumption of somebody's wishes, but they cannot consent because of age or mental status or something else. And so there, there are people that defend weak paternalism in medicine, you know, for example, doing research on children, children cannot give consent because of their age, but we still give them chemotherapy drugs and other things and study drugs on them um, because we think that it's in the best interests of the population. So going on with this concept of paternalism, Sorry about that. Um, patients who are hospitalized who are already vulnerable because of their state of illness are likely to experience distrust and fear due to this pervasive nature of Hippocratic practices and paternalism that still exist every day in medicine. We are biased as physicians. We have our own opinions on many things, including blood transfusions, that can further exacerbate that concept of paternalism and Hippocratic practices. So it's been well studied that physicians think that blood transfusions are not really dangerous, um, that they have few risks and that their risks are not as severe as other things that are out there compared to what laypersons think. So while we are generally very comfortable giving blood transfusions because we give them every day and not that many people have problems with them. We are going to just be inherently biased and tell our patients this transfusion is safe, you can take it. And even though the patients may not think the same way, we are in that unequal position as physicians and caregivers where we are going to convince the patients of that. So moving on, Hippocrates is still pervasive in our culture. Paternalism is still there. But in the 20th century, we sort of switched from this model of pure beneficence and non-maleficence to autonomy. And again, autonomy has been discussed before. I, I won't go too much into it in the interest of time. But autonomy really came about after the end of the Second World War. After the end of World War II, we were becoming much more aware of 
individual rights and civil rights, and people were going and getting higher education in greater numbers. And society was really growing and thought processes were emerging that allowed us to be much more cognizant of rights and responsibilities of individuals. What does that mean for the Jehovah's Witnesses? Well, back in the 19... 30s and 40s during World War II, there was this huge expansion of blood product utilization. Blood products were being used in the war and blood banks were being, were proliferating across the world. And we were coming up with these new concepts of, you know, using blood for cardiac surgery to save lives and treating hemophiliacs and, and other conditions that required blood. Um, and blood product usage was expanding tremendously in the post-war era. Co this coincided along with the Watchtower's initial ban on blood transfusions that occurred in 1945. And so this is where the initial discordance between the Jehovah's Witness community and medical pre professionals started, was back in the 1940s. Um, but, in for but actually, that actually turned 180 degrees about 20 years later when the AIDS epidemic occurred and people became very, very concerned about the actual risks of blood products. And so in the 70s and 80s, 80s, we started going and looking towards ways of, of minimizing uses of blood and blood transfusions. Um, but the damage, unfortunately, had already been done. And there were many publications in the 50s and 60s about how Jehovah's Witnesses were, you know, not following in the best interest because they were not accepting blood and all of these things. So the damage was done in the 1940s, so about 90 years ago. So where does this lead us with informed consent? So again, after World War II, informed consent became recognized. So this is actually quite interesting to me. And we didn't really have a concept of informed consent until the early 1900s. And then in the post-World War II area, era with the trials of the Nazi criminals, this established the Nuremberg Code, which really emphasized the importance of informed consent. But informed consent didn't obtain its formal name and legal recognition until 1957, when there was a landmark court case against Stanford University where a man basically went in for an aortic surgery procedure, became paralyzed and sued, and the judge in his ruling identified the lack of informed consent and why this was important. So informed consent is a relatively new concept. It's only been around for like less than 70 years, which I find fascinating. But again, that may be why we are not always using it as best as we could, because it's a relatively new concept um, and we, we are still evolving in our practice of medicine as to how to best understand and utilize informed consent. So there are multiple principles of informed consent, um, including volunteerism, decision-making capacity. I think we all know about decision-making capacity. That's one of the most important things that we, that I learned as a resident and student in getting informed consent. You want to make sure that your patient has capacity. These other factors we didn't talk about too much, disclosure and understanding and actually having the patient make the decision and then volunteerism. What's volunteerism? So volunteerism means that the patient needs to be free of coercion and unfair persuasions when they undergo informed consent. And coercion is the inappropriate pressures from institutions or individuals that keep us from making independent choices as patients. So I actually, I chose this picture for this slide because this is how doctors are presented in the media. And if you look on a hospital website, the pictures of the doctors always tend to look like this. You have your arms folded, you look powerful, you look like you're in control and you can tell the patient what to do. Well, that's a problem because then this is where coercion comes in. So we see this a lot with the bloodless medicine patients. Um, I don't think in my hospital, but, uh, but we hear this from, from patients who come from other hospitals. They are definitely undergoing coercion when people separate the witness patients from their from the HLC or don't let their relatives in the room with them and try to convince them to take blood products. Um, that's coercion, in my opinion. Um, if we don't disclose the risks of the alternative, the risk and alternatives of, of transfusion to the witness patients, that's also an adequate disclosure. And if the patients do not have a full understanding of their condition, that also limits their ability to give informed consent. Some people might say, well, this doesn't happen. Well, I can tell you it does. I actually wrote a um, ethics article and submitted it to an ethics journal about a month ago. And within the last couple of weeks, I got the reviewers' responses back. And one of the reviewers actually suggested that I, that I talk about how Jehovah's Witness patients are ostracized from their community if they take blood. 
Um, and that is obviously not true. But again, this is something that's perpetuated. And if a, if a medical ethicist expert um, thinks that it's true, I can only imagine what a typical physician would think. So we, we do need to be aware that these limitations to informed consent occur, and we need to be aware of the importance of taking into account all of these factors of, of informed consent when we take care of blood cells in patients. So how do we support anemic patients with compassion? So we do need to understand the limitations of that Hippocratic model of ethics. Um, we need to eliminate coercion, achieve adequate disclosures of risk and benefits, and then optimize our patient's understanding of the procedures and the risk and benefits and the alternatives to transfusion. So let's just go back to the opening case. So in the case that I described earlier, why did the hematologist send the patient to palliative care um, and tell the patient that nothing else could be done? I actually don't know the answer. I'm just going to leave this for you to think about on your own. Um, some possibilities are maybe the physician's values were just inconsistent with those of the patient. Um, I, I don't think the patient was trying to be uncompassionate, but maybe the the values, the, the pathway of healing that that physician had was different than that of the patient. I, I think that there was inadequate disclosure, um, and that might have been related to a knowledge deficit on the uh, part of the hematologist, that they just didn't know that there were alternatives to, you know, if iron doesn't work, that there's other things that can be done with the patient to enhance anemia. Um, but then I think that we do have to consider the impact of stress. And certainly maybe the, the hematologist was very stressed because his patient had a critically low hemoglobin of two or three and, you know, he was stressed and, and stress begets fear and fear causes a lack of compassion. So what can we do differently? Um, we need to be aware of paternalism and try to eliminate it, although I will say that that's going to be very difficult to do, and that will probably take decades for us to, to uh, finalize the medicine since it's so deeply entrenched in our system. Uh, we need to uh, enhance patient disclosures of alternatives and be aware of them. Um, make sure that our patients are aware of the alternatives to their, to their condition, to the treatments for their condition, and we need to be aware of and try to reduce the impacts of fear and stress because those are going to alter our ability to be compassionate. Um, thank you for listening. If you have any questions, feel free to email me or give me a call. Thank you.